the tribes were caught up in a continuing pattern of warfare and violence. Something was needed to break the pattern. In the same year he had made his mystical night flight to Jerusalem, Muhammad met six pilgrims from Yathrib, making the annual pilgrimage, or Hajj, to the Kaaba in Mecca. He told the men of his mission and recited the verses from the Quran. The men were immediately moved by Muhammad's message, but they also saw in the Prophet someone who could mediate the stalemate of violence in Yathrib. They made him an offer. The citizens of Yathrib would submit to Allah. In exchange, Muhammad would become their leader. Muhammad was invited to a community that was in many ways divided and in disarray. And they basically invited him saying that they, they needed a strong leader to come in and to organize and lead that community. Muhammad saw a chance to expand Islam in Yathrib. He also saw a haven that would protect him and his followers from persecution. He urged all Muslims to pack their things and leave Mecca for a new life. It was a dangerous undertaking, but the Muslims were willing to take their chances. Muhammad and his closest disciples stayed behind until most of his followers had left Mecca. Quraysh leaders soon realized that once Muhammad left, he would be beyond their control and would become a leader of their rivals and possible enemies. The choice was made. Muhammad must die before he reached the new land. So that no one clan would have to bear responsibility, it was decided that one member of each would plunge a sword into Muhammad at the same time. The men frantically searched Mecca, but Muhammad had been warned of the threat and had made his escape. The following morning, horsemen pursued Muhammad and at last followed his trail to the entrance of a cave. Muhammad and a disciple were hiding inside. But Muslim tradition says the Quraysh assassins found a pigeon nesting at the cave's mouth and the entrance covered with a spider web. The Quraysh concluded no one could be inside. Allah had protected his prophet. The flight from Mecca in 622 is known to Muslims as the Hijra. No event has greater importance in the culture of Islam. It became the start of the Muslim calendar. It was because it was the start of the establishment of the Muslim community. So that unlike the Gregorian calendar that starts with the birth date of Christ, um, the Muslim calendar or the Islamic calendar, which is based on the lunar calendar, um, is one that is based on this concept of community. When Muhammad arrived in Yathrib, people rushed to meet him and all wanted the honor of having him stay in their house. Instead, Muhammad allowed his favorite camel, Kazwa, to wander unguided through the town. When at last Kazwa stopped and fell to her knees, Muhammad declared that was the spot where he would live. He ordered work to begin on a house and the first mosque. Henceforth, Yathrib would be called Medina, a name simply meaning the city. But the greatest change would be in the very nature of the community itself. Muhammad's visions brought new words to unite both his own followers from Mecca and the people of Medina. The Quran now had a new verse. Those who believed and made the Hijra, and those who gave their homes and helped, these are the protectors of one another. What he began to create in Medina was something that was absolutely unheard of and novel in uh, Arabia. It was a community bound together by an ideal, by a shared ideology, by a shared religion, not by blood. He was creating, as it were, a super tribe uh, where people were not related to one another, but they were related to one, one another in faith and by agreement. If you think about 7th century Arabia being based on tribal kinship, the idea of a community based on a faith that anyone could join, slave, woman, man, rich, poor, dark, light, um, was revolutionary. And of course, very menacing for some. To further unite the Muslim peoples, Muhammad ended his mourning for Khadija 
and began to take new wives. In all, he would marry 11 women from many different tribes and clans. About seven months after the Muslims arrived in Medina, the first mosque was completed. It contained a large courtyard for saying prayers. Several methods were considered for calling Muslims to prayer. A ram's horn, like the Jews, a bell, like the Christians. Finally, it was decided that only a human voice was needed to proclaim the call to prayer that Muhammad taught his people. A young man was selected to make the call, and for the first time, Muslims heard the words that still echo from mosques around the world, beckoning all to come to God. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the apostle of God. Come to prayer. Come to prayer. Muhammad had believed he was calling the faithful back to a religion Arabs shared with Judaism and Christianity. But following Allah's orders, the Prophet now set out to create a new identity for the Islamic community that would separate it from the older forms of monotheism. The Quran also and the Prophet believed that the revelation that had been given to Moses in what is called the Torah and, and, and the revelation to Jesus had become distorted historically, not by the prophets, but by their later communities. To dramatize the shift away from Christianity and Judaism, another order became part of the Quran. Muslims were no longer to face Jerusalem when they prayed. Forever after, God's faithful would pray facing Mecca and the Kaaba. Muhammad now had the responsibility of dealing with the mundane but important tasks of government. These roles would set him apart from the ministry of Islam's earlier prophet, Jesus Christ. There is an immense contrast between Jesus and Muhammad, uh, largely stemming in for, from the fact that uh, unlike uh, Muhammad, Jesus was never head of state. Muhammad was now a political leader. That meant he was making decisions affecting the workforce, the economy, trade, and the safety and security of Medina. To protect the struggling young community, Muhammad knew the basic politics of Arabia would need to change, and that meant the threat of the Quraysh would have to be met. Increasingly, Muhammad would turn to a solution the world has come to fear and all too often associate with Islam. He would turn to armed conflict. Since the days in Mecca, God's revelations had called for Muslims to prepare themselves to struggle to build a moral and righteous life. The Arabic word for this moral struggle is jihad. Jihad would soon be needed if the Muslim community was to survive. For when the Prophet and his followers had left Mecca, it was clear to all that a day would come when they would have to defend their beliefs in battle. Now that day was fast approaching. Out of respect for the beliefs and practices of Muslims, no image of the Prophet Muhammad or his immediate family will be shown in this biography. Although the religious foundation of Islam included Jesus' message of peace, it had also taken on the Jewish tradition of justice. The Quran's verses that flowed from Muhammad's mouth were now beginning to include a message justifying armed defense of the community. Permission is given to fight because they are wrong. Verily, Allah is most powerful for their aid. They are those who have been expelled from their homes. Muhammad's plans for the defense of the community now began to include the word jihad. It is a term that is often cited by those who oppose Islam as evidence of the religion's reliance on violence and war. But the true meaning of jihad is something quite different. Jihad comes from the Arabic root jihada, which means struggle. It is consistently referred to as a struggle for the sake of God. If the jihad is financial, you respond financially. If the jihad is violent, you respond violently. And these become uh, ways, again, of reestablishing peace. But in history, uh, that notion of jihad then comes to be appropriated and hijacked at a very early period by extremists 
And that then connects to what extremists like Osama...